Dear students in EU Kenkyu and EU Kenki Newman at uh, Rikyu Daigaku, welcome to the last uh, lecture on demand on uh, EU topics. And thank you for attending last week's presentation by the German Consul General, Mr. Eberts. Um, before I start to talk about aspects of European arts and EU cultural policies, um, I have to announce the final testing uh, arrangement. You can see today, um, on Wednesday, European cultural policies and film will be on demand at YouTube. Uh, and then the day after Wednesday, um, this week, Thursday, I will post the final exam uh, topics on web class. You can access them on web class. Uh, then the examination period starts. It's more than one week. You have, uh, in, in fact, uh, eight or nine days um, to do what? Um, you will be given a list of topics of questions and uh, probably about 10, quite quite a lot. And they all have something to do with uh, lectures in our series. Um, you are ask, asked uh, to select two topics from this list of questions, only two. And then please write essays of at least 250 words in uh, European language or 400 Japanese characters. Uh, so it's one essay on each of the two topics, two essays. Email these essays to me, please. And there will be a bonus available if you write in a European language. That's very important. Please uh, try to write in a foreign language. Um, you will uh, receive an extra few points for that. If there are any questions, um, email them to me, but please wait until Thursday, July 29th to receive the list of topics and an, an explan a further explanation how this whole system works. Now on to today's lecture, aspects of European arts and EU cultural policies. First, we have to ask ourselves, what is culture? What, what really is meant by culture? If you look uh, it up in the dictionary, um, you find explanations like this, the beliefs, customs, arts, etc. of a particular society, group, place or time. Uh, so culture can be uh, um, can belong to a society, a country in fact, uh, a group within a society or a cross-national group. Uh, it can be linked to any place and any time. Of course, there's historical cultures that do not quite exist any longer. Uh, a particular society uh, which has its own beliefs, ways of life, art, etc. So that is culture too. Um, it uh, is the characteristics of a particular society. Um, a few examples are, well, first the source and then uh, examples. What is uh, arts? Uh, arts is part of culture, in fact, an important part of culture. Um, I will give you examples very soon. The arts are outlets of expression and strongly influenced by culture. And arts are also an agent of change. Arts can change culture. Um, as such, the arts are a physical manifestation of the internal creative impulse. So creative expressions um, influenced by culture and also able to change culture. Um, this is a difficult sentence. So here we have it in Japanese on the Japanese Wikipedia. Arts and culture. Now let's talk about both together. Arts being a core aspect of culture. And they are at the core of, uh, together they are at the core of the identity of a social group, a country, or even a continent, or a group of any group of countries. Um, few examples. Youth culture exists in, I suppose, every country. What culture is peculiar to young people in a society 
or a food culture and then relate it to one country, Japanese food culture. You may talk about Chinese or Italian food culture as well. Or French culture, the national culture of France. Obviously, um, uh, that is one country here in, you know, in, in blue. And talking about the continent, how about European culture? Is there a European culture? We will uh, follow this question and try to answer these questions uh, very soon. Many groups and all countries support their arts uh, because they are expressions of their culture. Um, you will probably not find a, a government around the world that says um, arts are not important. Perhaps <laughs> Donald Trump's government was slightly different, but usually the governments and countries try to support their arts. Uh, so, if countries support their arts, uh, how does the European Union, which is not a country, but a union of several countries, uh, not an entire continent, but a large part of Europe, how do, do uh, the e does the EU support arts? Um, of course, the question at the core, we have to answer first, what really is European culture? What is European art? And then, uh, how can that be supported, effectively supported? Um, here's um, something for you to um, do some active work. Please think of as many forms of arts as you can and write them down. You can pause the lecture here. Please take a few minutes, a short break, uh, get out a piece of paper and write down as many forms of art as you can. You'll be astonished. There are so many and uh, uh, they will come to you when you think for a while. Meanwhile, I am going to continue now. Uh, the break is over when you hear me here. And uh, this is what the dictionary, the Encyclopedia Britannia has on this. Uh, Britannica, sorry, the, uh, they group uh, art first in uh, in groups literature visual arts graphic arts decorative arts performing arts architecture and music um, probably in east asia um, other areas of uh, artistic expression would be included like uh, pottery or maybe even food um, this is uh, i admit this is a view from europe literature um, have a look at that some individual arts of course literature comprises many forms poetry drama story novels short stories uh, you name it visual uh, visual arts is uh, that those are things you can see painting uh, drawing sculpture photography uh, it partly overlaps with graphic arts uh, graphic arts are defined as arts that are expressed on flat surfaces. Surfaces. If you have a, a piece of paper, um, a screen, a canvas screen, um, a wall, uh, uh, um, <laughs> a, a train in some uh, cities in Europe, uh, a train where people uh, uh, apply graffiti as an art form, although that's controversial, of course. Um, that is uh, graphic arts and it goes on decorative arts um, here it lists uh, pottery as uh, uh, one of those um, performing arts that's what you usually people do on stage or on on screen theater opera dance music film and others and music uh, of course go ah sorry architecture I overlooked that may include interior design and music of course many many individual forms so we are using here a wide um, concept of culture and a wide concept of arts many many uh, arts are included now is there european art um, case one Well, here's a sculpture, 
and uh, maybe you've seen that in history books. It's very, very famous. It's the statue of the Emperor Augustus of the Roman Empire, first century AD. So this is almost 2000 years old. Look at uh, the emperor who wears a military costume and points with his right arm. So he's a general too, and he's in charge of his armies and his people. We move on, same country, Italy, 1,400 years later, have a look at the statue of the condottiere Gattamelata, who, is also, who was also a general uh, by Donatello in Padova in Italy. Uh, look, it's the same uh, well, type of armor Augustus wears, although this man is just a general, he's not an emperor. He points with his right arm, has a staff as a, a symbol of command. Uh, the main difference really is that uh, uh, Gattamelata is on horseback, whereas Augustus uh, still stands on his own feet. So apparently a Roman idea here has survived 1,400 years and reappears with variation. And it appears time and again because the equest equestrian statue, the statue of mounted kings and generals, is a classic of European sculpture. This is in Berlin, 19th century. Uh, Christian Daniel Rauch is the artist, and it's a statue of King Frederick I of Prussia, also in military uniform on horseback. Uh, main difference here, his right arm is not stretched out. The 20th century, then, things uh, change a lot um, in several countries. These uh, statues, figures of uh, um, important people, of usually kings or military people, come out of fashion in uh, many Western European countries, at least. Uh, for instance, in uh, the city of Düsseldorf, the artist, local artist Bert Geresheim, um, did this very controversial figure of uh, Heinrich Heine, Split Heine. Heine w lived about 200 years ago in Düsseldorf and in France. He, he is the most famous uh, writer ever uh, uh, been born in Düsseldorf. Uh, he, when he was alive, uh, many people did not like him. Um, he, he was Jewish. He had political views that uh, were prosecuted by authorities and he was basically exiled and driven out of Germany. So he had a, had a rough time. And here in this um, completely unheroic statue, you can see uh, he's dissected. He, there's his head. There are other body parts lying around. Uh, there are items from his life, like, like a drum. Maybe he used that to play with, as a kid. And if you wander across this uh, space, you can actually freely walk around. It's in a public park. Um, you'll find many more hints on um, his life. He, you can also see that his mouth is somewhat shut up, so he, he should not express his views. And it's a very critical monument. It uh, shows what uh, we, or the people in Düsseldorf, in Germany, in the past, did to one of their greatest sons, a very talented writer who had a very difficult life. So I, I would like to pose the claim that uh, um, European art has this very, very long tradition since uh, Greek and uh, Roman times, but it also is possible to change traditions and to um, construct a more critical, a modernist view on things, to deconstruct, literally deconstruct um, the glorious statues of the past. Here's another example of uh, modern art. Um, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, from uh, Germany. Because that's because I, I know examples best uh, from Germany. Um, the artist is Wolf Hostel. And he, uh, using a lot of public money, he got a grant for that. He constructed two concrete Cadillacs in the shape of naked Maja. Maya, Ma Ma I'm not sure about pronunciation. Uh, you can find this in the city of Berlin. And actually, he used two brand new American cars, a very expensive American cars, and encased them in, conc in concrete. They, uh, 
were destroyed as working cars in the process of making this statue and uh, you get um, the reference here um, the word Maya which Fostel used to describe his uh, or to, to name his work of art goes back to Francesco Goya a famous Spanish painter and whose, uh, whose picture La Ma Ma Maya desnuda uh, can be found in Madrid in the Prado and if you look at uh, how the naked body of the young woman is portrayed and how the Cadillac in in the front of uh, uh, the sculpture uh, is shown you can see uh, that Fostel um, makes a quote from European art history here S however um, I'm not going to talk so much about this uh, um, this connection we have talked about the historical roots even of modern European art and the cultural um, history that runs through that through that there is more there is um, something I find is uniquely European because I have not seen it in many other countries um, there are there's critical art there is provocative art like the uh, Heine document and of course these Cadillacs uh, built with a lot of public money wa wasted cars if you want to uh, want it that way provoked a lot of public criticism um, many people did not like this work of art at all and uh, this led to this gesture um, a group of uh, businessmen just ordinary citizens um, who were together in the pub one night and talked about um, the monument which you see in the back the Cadillacs and they really did not like it and they did not stop at the uh, ending you know at, at just complaining they got creative themselves they got the cheapest car that was av available back then uh, a Trabant East German Trabant car um, cheap small car and also put that in concrete because one of them had a had a company um, that had the ability to to pour concrete in such shapes and then overnight one night they uh, drove a truck and placed it next to the Cadillacs on the same square in Berlin and in the morning everybody this square is actually quite a horrible place with lots and lots of cars and it's uh, it's uh, um, not a comfortable city space it really is a 1970s 80s um, uh, commuter paradise if you want it and they placed uh, their Trabant there and in the morning all the, those people coming in with their cars driving into the city passing the Cadillacs they saw this too and it included a statement unity and the right to artistic liberty um, right to artistic liberty so these citizens criticize a public a work of art in a public space um, but they support the right of artistic liberty and their support for this basic freedom leads to a creative um, output I mean ordinary citizens creating uh, their own work of art as a response to another work of art um, I have not heard stories like this in from uh, Japan or other Asian countries for instance um, this is probably um, this shows how deeply rooted um, democratic ideals can be in, in European societies and um, what kind of creative energy they can uh, they can create actually art and democracy is an important topic um, a political topic of course every man is an artist or rather every man can be an artist famous uh, book and uh, point of view by Josef Beuys who was one of the um, foremost and uh, most provocative uh, modern artists in post-war Germany uh, Beuys position is this every human being has abilities and is self-determined he or she is the sovereign of our times so the people rule that's democracy he or she is an artist or 
can be an artist, regardless of whether uh, someone is working at a garbage dump, as a nurse, as a doctor, as an engineer, or as a farmer. So each and uh, every person has the ability to become an artist, to be creative, to produce works of art. Case two, European art, still in search of European art, architecture. Have a quiz for you. Where do you find these buildings? Did you recognize this building? Well, of course, it's in Washington DC in the United States. Or this one. Well, it's not in southern Spain, as one might think. It's actually in Cuba. Or here. People might think this is a boulevard in Paris, in, in Paris, in France, but in fact, it's in Shanghai. And then this building, you might uh, know, it is in Tokyo, not in Amsterdam or in a northern European city. So the point is that all these building styles, vastly different uh, architectural styles, but they are all European. They all originated in Europe and then got exported around the world to each and every country. So if we talk about European art, it's quite clear that there is European architecture, which is so strong that it heavily influenced architectural styles all around the world. Yeah, here we go. To sum it up, the periods of European art, which are in a way world art, um, they start on the left-hand side with uh, prehistoric uh, arts, and then uh, they move on ancient art, ancient Egypt, uh, Greece, Rome, uh, Christian art, Byzantine, and then here we have the Middle Ages, Romanesque, Gothic. We have Renaissance here. This block is Renaissance, born in Italy, uh, stretching even to Northern Europe. Then Baroque and Rococo styles in the 17th and 18th century, um, much inspired by French, Baroque inspired by French um, architecture, Versailles, the uh, castle of the French King, Louis XIV. Neoclassicism, which is in fact a feedback to Greece and Rome. Romanticism. Uh, we, when we get into the 19th century, uh, the uh, trends change faster, the styles change, change faster. Realism, impression, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Van Gogh, you can see him here, um, Picasso, Expressionism, and so on and so forth. Then we enter the 20th century, we have Cubism, Futurism, and uh, other styles, Dada, Surrealism, Abstract Art, Pop Art, Minimalism, and so on and so forth. So let's get back to the European Union, to the Euro, the money that uh, most European Union member states use. Um, you can actually, when you look at the money, if you take it in your hands or look at pictures, you can see something um, that has a lot to do with European culture, with architecture in this case. Um, the one side of the build, starting with five euros, always shows a window, and the back side always shows a bridge. Um, have a look at the 500 euro bill, which is, uh, as far as I understand, not printed any longer. Uh, this is something like Nana Man Yen. It's, it's too big. Criminals liked the big de denomination. It's not being used any longer. But here you have a very modern um, uh, free uh, spanning bridge. And in fact, these are all the bills and all the bridges starting with 5 euro. 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 500. And you can see the architectural, it's always a bridge, but the architectural style changes. It starts with the Roman bridge uh, at five and then Romanesque, medieval, then Gothic. Uh, 50 is Baroque or re Renaissance, 17th, 18th century. 100 um, is uh, uh, 
I'm sorry, 100 is the Baroque uh, or, or uh, Rococo bridge, 50 is Re Renaissance, more 16th century style, 200 is uh, what you call techyo, ano re, ano, um, um, ferro concrete, a steel bridge, uh, 19th century industrial architecture, and 500 is the 20th century with a modern uh, bridge. Uh, also, the, uh, there is a pe peculiar color linked to each uh, bridge and to each bill, so that you can see, uh, even from a distance, you can, if you just see the color, you, you can know uh, what this bill is worth. Here is uh, the summary of the explanations. You have the ancient, the classical style for five, Romanesque, Gothic, and, and so on and so forth. Um, if you want to take the time, please have a closer look while we move on here. Um, I want to show you what happened with the Euro bridges in the Netherlands. Um, the European Central Bank did not want to use real bridges when these bills were released 19 years ago. Um, no particular country, of course, there are famous bridges across Europe, uh, actually many more than the seven uh, that were chosen for the bills. Um, but they, the idea was Europe didn't want to show the um, a particular bridge, famous bridge from a particular country, but rather they wanted to show a bridge in European architectural styles that can be found in all or uh, almost all European countries. And uh, the idea, this idea actually came from an Austrian designer. You also see his picture, Robert Kalina. He, he created fictitious bridges too represent typical architectural styles through European history. And that's what we have today. Uh, the Dutch designer Robert Stamm, however, in, turned this idea on its head in uh, 2014. Have a look. Uh, soon in uh, a suburb of Rotterdam, um, he uh, got the uh, um, got the job to model seven bridges, small bridges in this area, and he modeled them exactly as exactly as possible on the bridges uh, of the banknotes. Uh, of course, in color dyed concrete. Have a look. This is of course the five euro. It's uh, oddly it's uh, about the biggest bridge here. Um, it goes on with the medieval Romanesque. And this is Renaissance, 16th century, down to the right color. Um, and have a look at what he did. <laughs> uh, if you follow this and read interviews by Robert Stamm, uh, he said many people living there uh, considered the bridges actually ugly and did not like them very much. But after a while, everybody understood the story behind them. They are, they are a manifestation of uh, European cultural identity. And then most people found the bridges really, really funny, uh, worth seeing whenever you come to the Netherlands. So quite clearly, it seems that there is a European art, or there are European arts as part of the European culture. It helps to link European countries together in the European Union, and it creates a common identity as Europeans. We have similar arts, for instance, buildings, building styles in our countries. So let's move on to the second part. Uh, what does the EU to promote both these arts? If, if they exist, if they are important for European identity, surely the European Union will invest ideas and money to promote this. How does that happen? It happens mainly with the EU's culture uh, program. If you look at the, this, um, it started with Culture 2000. It always runs six years. It was called Culture Program, then Creative Europe. It's uh, the new, uh, the current program is also called Creative Europe. And if you look at 2014, the budget allocation for these six years was 2.24 billion euros, which was a 30% increase over the previous six year program. 
actually cover seven years. Uh, okay. Um, I have trouble reading the number in uh, Japanese yen, but uh, uh, as you see, it really is a lot of money invested in European culture and arts. Well, why so much money? Of course, the European Union, um, the people running the European Union need to justify um, how they spend tax money from European countries. Um, we talked about European identity. But we can also talk about business because the culture sector is more and more a source of job, uh, job creation. It contributes to economic growth in Europe. For instance, if you look at uh, popular cities like London, Amsterdam, Milan, Berlin, Rome, Madrid, um, about 20% of all new jobs there are in the creative uh, industries, people who do creative things, 20%. Uh, then. Another argument is culture also promotes social inclusion um, through our people can meet and feel uh, themselves included in groups through art. At the same time, um, art culture is relatively free. People are free to express themselves. So it supports cultural diversity. And then finally, it links countries who have shared cultures or share cultural heritage. We, of course, we uh, uh, highlighted that with uh, the example of architectural styles. So let's have a look at the last program, Creative Europe. Um, where did the money go? You see the biggest, um, about 40% of the budget or more, um, 900 million euro went to cinema and the audio audiovisual sector. We will come to that a little later. So uh, apparently cinema was identified as something which the European Union can support, should support. Other cultural activities, forms of art, uh, only got 500 million compared to that. Then um, support for small enterprises financing culture. Um, that is, small companies who make it possible that artists can um, perform. So that uh, uh, has a direct impact on the economy, obviously. All in all, Creative Europe supported some 300,000 artists, 1,000 films, 2,500 cinemas, and 5,500 books, so quite, quite a massive amount of money and uh, the successor the current program is also called creative europe and it runs through 2027 the budget has become even bigger um 2.4 billion euros well this is this is uh, organizational change um there were several programs the culture program media mundus uh, media programs um, they are all now all part of Creative Europe and it has a culture strand and then the media strand, media we should not forget, and a cross sectoral strand. That means um, uh, support for projects that link various uh, activities, cultural, culture related activities. Now let's have a more specific look. What, what actually are the cultural activities of the European Union? It starts with the European Month of Culture um, that takes place in the United States very often, one month uh, during which uh, European culture is highlighted in a, in a big city, um, hoping to attract many, many people. The European Union runs a youth orchestra, a symphony orchestra. Um, it, then there is the program European Capital of Culture. We'll have a closer look at that soon. European Heritage Days and the Video Archive in Cineropa. That's where actually a lot of money uh, goes into um, modern videos, short films, artistic films are not really as much collected and preserved as books are in, in libraries. Uh, so the European Union gives money to help uh, collect for future times uh, um, films, videos. Um, Cinerop is uh, support actually also for movie houses so that movies can be shown. 
small movie houses, not big multiplex chains, chains, small independent movie houses. If you talk about Naha, it would be Sakura Zaka, for instance, not the cine star, the big, the, what, what is it called, the big uh, multiplexes. They have, a, have, a, have programs to support dance activities, the European Book Prize, Erasmus, Erasmus Plus, which uh, um, applies to young people who want to study in European country, also from around the world. And then they have the European Cultural Roots, uh, which I want to highlight um, here. Um, the, the idea is, of course, every country has cultural uh, or places of cultural history, but in fact, in Europe, many, many cultural aspects of cultural history of culture are, can be found in several countries. It links countries. If you look at, for instance, the second, the Hansa, um, that was the medieval, obviously the medieval um, league of uh, seafaring, trading uh, cities. Uh, across Scandinavia, northern Germany, even London was a, a Hansa city. Um, the Viking routes will come to that. European Mozart ways. Mozart did not spend all his time in Austria. He also traveled abroad. Uh, Jewish heritage can be found in many European countries. Also, the olive tree is home to all southern European countries, and it goes on and so forth. A destination Napoleon, of course, Napoleon uh, made his wars across Europe. Um, and uh, the other uh, European cultural route I want to highlight, there are actually more than these examples, is the Iron Curtain Trail in a minute. But let's get started with the Viking routes. Um, as you know, the Viking Age was from the 8th to the 11th century, quite a while ago. Vikings came originally from Scandinavia, but they traveled everywhere. Northern Europe, Western Europe, England, France, Germany, uh, into the Mediterranean and uh, deep uh, into Russia and the Ukraine. They even came to Byzance, which is uh, uh, obviously mostly in Asia. Um, so. The Vikings really were one historical, one cultural group that linked Europe together long before modern, most modern national states were born and, of course, long before the European Union. In their small but uh, very able boats, they just got everywhere, including to Iceland and uh, North America. So this Viking route uh, in the European Cultural Routes program covers places in Hedeby, in Germany, in Birka, Sweden, York, uh, that's United Kingdom, uh, Dublin, Ireland, Kiev, Ukraine, so more than 10 countries across Europe take part in this program. Um, there are about 100 sites uh, on this route, like uh, remains of towns, uh, ships actually that survived, objects, museum, reconstructed longhouses, you name it. Here, that's one of these sites where people can actually dress uh, like Vikings. And uh, so travelers can discover Viking culture through a journey across national borders. It's a very European idea. The borders do not matter. The Vikings matter. And the European Union does not have to spend that much money because countries are interested in participating and preparing their sites. Um, the European Union um, supports uh, the, uh, the marketing side of it. Um, a small group of people who work on this, who coordinate this, they offer services like, like apps for your smartphone, translation help, uh, translated things. They organize events like Viking markets, very popular, where handmade goods can be, well, they can be made and then they can be sold and purchased. The other example I picked up is the Iron Curtain Trail. You know, that's uh, the, the term Iron Curtain is was coined by Sir Winston Churchill, the British wartime prime minister. Um, he, the Iron Curtain lasted from 1945 to 1991, so fairly until fairly recently. And uh, it uh, was the it was actually lots of walls and fences that divided Eastern Europe, run by the Soviet Union, the communist part 
of Europe from Western Europe, uh, mostly NATO countries or at least democratic countries, which are shown in a violet color here. So um, you see the Iron Curtain actually stretched from Northern Finland, Northern Finland and Soviet Union, Russia nowadays, through the Baltic Sea and then through Germany, between West Germany and East Germany, and uh, so on and so forth, down to the side, uh, to the south. Uh, Yugoslavia, which is shown in yellow, was not aligned. It was not part of the Western or Eastern world. And then um, uh, it run, also runs through Greek and between Bulgaria and the, uh, uh, Turkey. So what actually, what can you do if you choose to travel the Iron Curtain Trail? Um, he, here it is. You see the number 13. Uh, that is because this route also is the European Velo Trail, so bicycle route 13 in Europe. Um, it's 10,000 kilometers actually, so probably nobody can travel it all. Of course, people are invited to travel just those parts they like and they can manage. Um, uh, there are trains, planes, you can use a car or a bus, but especially and special encouragement is on using bicycles, European Velo Route 13. So there's support for bicycle, bicyclists, like information applications for smartphones, um, making sure that uh, places where people can stay uh, overnight are available and so on and so forth. And uh, what is interesting is not just the history, the remains, buildings, but also very, very different landscapes, uh, unique habitats along the former border. 20 countries are touched. And uh, the interesting part is local organizers offer also activities. So in fact, if you check in uh, at their website, they can bring you in contact with local people along the Iron Curtain Trail who probably speak some English. And these local people will tell you how, how it was when the Iron Curtain was still in place until 1991. They will tell you stories how it was to live on one side of this wall in Europe. And uh, that will create a unique experience for the tourists. And again, here, the, every country um, or localities and countries um, take efforts. The European Union links it all together and provides infrastructure for this trail. I come to the, uh, to the program European Capitals of Culture, which exists uh, uh, since quite a while. Actually, this is only the last uh, year running until next year. You can see every year two European, uh, in fact, even next year, even three, that's uh, due to Corona pandemic, slightly irregular. Um, two European cities are chosen and become the culture, capitals of culture for one year which means that uh, many, many cultural activities take place, and many uh, tourists and visitors are drawn. And for these cities, it's a boost for their economy. It's uh, very positive. They can get on the tourist landscape. And if you look at the names of the cities, um, it's usually not the capital cities or those cities that are already very famous for cultural things that are chosen, but other cities in the countries. You see, you, ha you don't have uh, Madrid or Barcelona in Spain, you have San Sebastian. You don't have Warsaw in Poland, you got Wroclaw. Or not Copenhagen in Denmark, but Aarhus, and so on and so forth. Um, it helps um, cities that have had been minor cultural dis destinations uh, until now, helps them to get on the cultural landscape and to uh, draw uh, economic benefits from tourism. Then I owe you an explanation, uh, EU film support. Um, you remember that uh, quite a large amount of money uh, the EU spends on culture goes into film. How, how does it spend the money? Well, there are events uh, inside, but also outside of Europe, like the EU Film Days 
in Tokyo and in other cities. You have a have a poster here. Um, every year this takes place. Um, unfortunately, it's only in Tokyo, so um, one has to go to Tokyo to view a selection of uh, very very high quality and recent European films. The EU uh, helps to finance films, small independent films, um, not blockbusters so much, films that have uh, problems uh, finding enough money to be made. And then the film distribution support is actually a big chunk. Uh, cinemas get support so they can stay open and especially cinemas that show European films, of course, smaller films, artistic films, not so much Hollywood blockbusters who will find their audience anyway. Um, a focus is on uh, financing, helping international co-productions. So if several countries get together, um, uh, it is especially useful to try to apply to the European Union to get some funding. Well, European culture is even more than this picture with so many pictures, inside pictures and people assembled. Check it out. Enjoy European culture and arts. Uh, it's very rich and it's an important part of the EU. We have come to the end of today's lecture. Thank you for your attention. And uh, any comments or questions can be directed to me, Till Weber. And the last slide is this again, a reminder. Um, on July the 29th, we will post the final exams topics on web class. And then you have until August the 7th to submit your two essays to my web address. And uh, if you write in a European language or languages, um, it'll be just wonderful and you will be receiving a bonus. Thank you very much and goodbye for today.